Hello, I'm Rob and welcome to Quiet RC. Today, we're going to talk about my Schumacher MI8 build and how I broke it. Okay, let's start talking about the Schumacher MI8. This version is the alloy chassis. It also comes in a carbon fiber version. The alloy chassis was told to me, at least, as I'm more of a lover, not an expert with these, uh, was better for carpet. My local track where I race is the black carpet, so this allows for the chassis to be a little bit stiffer. Because it's such a high grip, you don't need as much uh, flexibility in the chassis to give you that little extra spring. Uh, in fact, the track that I usually run this at also has a hobby shop. So I bought this at that hobby shop. I try to buy locally where I can. I understand it's not always possible for a lot of people, but where you can, it's nice to, even if it just costs a couple dollars more. So as I got into this uh, in the manual, it shows you um, a few different places where it explicitly says, hey, use thread lock here. And then there are some places where it explicitly says, don't use thread lock. However, because a lot of these are these steel screws going into alloy parts. I just use thread lock everywhere. I got burned on my CRC carpet knife and had a couple of them come out where I should have just used thread lock. I should have just known even if it doesn't say explicitly. One thing that's great about putting together this kit is that it has step-by-step -step bags and each bag is labeled for each step specifically to the manual. So when you're actually putting it together you open up one bag and literally everything you need for that step is in there. I'm actually also in the middle of building a old Tamiya clod and it's a disaster because they just have a bag with all of the machine screws in it, uh, a bag with all of the tapping, self tapping screws in it, a bag with just other metal parts in it. Like it, it doesn't have anything to do with what step you're on. So this is a much nicer way that they set this up. The diffs for the rear are mostly straightforward. It's a gear diff. Uh, it's very straightforward. So when you are actually assembling the rear diff, there are fences that go on either side of the metal pulley. And those just kind of, they're plastic, but they snap onto it. The center pulley also has these fences that go onto it that you snap on, but they were so tight that I ended up having to use a heat gun, which I really hate using the heat gun because it's really powerful. Um, I didn't have a hair dryer on hand, otherwise I probably just would have used that. However, in the front, it's what they call just a spool. It's solid. Um, this is kind of new to me coming back to the hobby after so many years off, um, where kind of diffs and ball diffs and everything like that were something that you were always chasing after, trying to find like how to set your ball diff and things like that. But now it's a solid one. And my understanding is that as you are coming out of a corner, the fact that these aren't actually working off of a differential will pull the car straighter. So it's a little hard to see uh, in the car, but what you have here is the differential uh, up front. It's not a differential, it's a, just a solid piece of um, aluminum. Uh, when you're putting these in, the manual, I looked it over, over and over and over again, and it's not really explicit as to which way, uh, especially the front one faces. It is like a little offset. So I thought I'd put it in the right way even after checking. Came back after I had kind of set everything up, put you know the center pulley in, everything like that. And it was just, you could tell it wasn't quite lining up. So I was able to pop off just the top um, upper mount uh, pieces here, the carbon fiber pieces, and just flip it around. So fairly straightforward at least to fix it when it does go wrong. Just want to mention that when you're putting the top plate in, it just kind of has a little arrow that goes, uh, just do that. And really you have to end up kind of fishing it all the way through all of the belts and everything like that before you actually um, put it on here. So just one little tip for you. That's what's going on as you're uh, trying to put this together. Um, as you're uh, assembling all of the wishbones up front, which we'll get to the issue I had with the wishbone at the track, um, you do kind of make your own little tool. Uh, it's basically a maybe like an M3 uh, cap head screw with four washers and you use that to press in 
some of these um, little brass pieces. Pieces there. Um, there's some other ones. Um, so you just kind of like, because you can't press them in there, they're pressed into carbon fiber. So you build this little tool yourself, you use your 2.5 hex, and you just tighten it down and it pulls it into place. Some of the pieces actually come uh, a little pre-assembled. Um, so for example, the um, front universals, CVDs, whatever, uh, they were actually already put together. Um, I don't recall if the rear where it was or not, but out at the, um, at the outer hub here, uh, um, that's actually put together. There's some older kits that I've built where you're literally going through and you're putting it every little bit together. So that was kind of nice to have that already assembled. It does come with uh, two different type of upper arms. Now, I kind of chickened out and I went with the single turnbuckle version up here. So the MI-8 actually comes with a version where it has two turnbuckles up at the top that create your upper arm so you can adjust both caster and camber. For me, just not being a super serious racer, that was just another kind of setting for me to not get correct. So what's nice is the kit actually provides you with the single turnbuckle upper arms for the front and rear. And you just flip to another page in the manual and it shows you how to set those, uh, set those up, get them installed, everything like that. So that was kind of nice. That it gave you the option because even when I was looking to purchase a kit, all the press material, all the website has the dual turnbuckle upper arms at all four corners, which also just the idea of having to do eight turnbuckles uh, is just very daunting with the ball ends and everything like that. So it's nice that they, they give you that. And so when I opened it up and started putting it together, it had both of them. So like, this is great. I'm just going with the, the simpler one. Um, you do need a low profile servo for, um, for the kit, um, even though with how small receivers are, uh, and you can see there's actually a little bit of room here up front. Um, that's actually where I put my transponder, but you can see that the brace here is specific for a low profile servo. So you do have to use one. Um, I just have a 25 and a half turn uh, brushless in here, a RevTech. Um, I think it's actually still even set on, yeah, it's at about 35 degree timing just from another car that I pulled it out of. So I really didn't mess with that too much. Um, I do use the Tekken RS Pro. I have it in a couple of my cars. It's been pretty good for me. Again, I'm not expert enough to know when it's not working properly or it could be better or what I'm missing out on. Um, I do have the Bluetooth uh, dongle that you can put on here so you can get their app and you can just set up all of the, the various settings for that. So that was, that's pretty nice. I, I bought this and I got it with a combo with a 13 and a half turn uh, motor that I'm going to put in another car eventually. But just for right now, I just wanted to have a 25.5 so I could have some little lower speed as I get used to it possible at the end of this I'll have some run footage hopefully we'll see um, the shocks uh, you can see here they are just so tiny they're so low profile they're so short but they're just excellent pieces of equipment um, the building of these shocks is actually kind of nice um, they provide you with a couple tools in the kit, but one tool specifically to help hold the shock. And instead of where I'm used to having an E-clip uh, on the kind of the shaft, and then you put the piston piece in and then another E-clip, which just gets annoying after a while, you go to clip them and they spring all over the place. This is actually a uh, shaft with like a T-top on it. And then you just put that piston right on top of it and you screw in uh, an actual bolt, which is nice because that's much easier to do. Uh, still at the bottom, you do have to put in a uh, ball end here or a ball cup that will snap on like everything else. But they do suggest a couple of things that I didn't do. Um, one thing they suggest is the O-ring that goes inside of the collar that you turn to adjust the uh, spring tension or the ride height to a certain degree. Um, they say to like cut that and take a little piece out so it's a little bit easier to turn. 
I didn't do that because I figured you can always go back and do that if it's if it's an issue enough. The other thing that they wanted um, was for you to drill a hole in the shock end cap, the plastic part, to vent the top of the shock or right outside of the um, kind of rubber membrane that goes inside there. Uh, I think they wanted a 1.02 millimeter, um, which must translate to something. Maybe I'll put that on here uh, as far as uh, like SAE goes. Uh, I didn't have anything smaller than a 1 16th, so I didn't want to vent it. They said this kind of like a race setup. So again, it's something I can come back and do. Um, just a little bit more difficult to undo it if I did it wrong. So they also offer you a few different options for uh, battery hold downs. Um, you can see here that there's a couple spacers here, and then this part just flips over the top of the battery. Um, also, there are some screws right here that allow you to adjust the specific uh, you know, length of whatever battery you're using. Now, right now I have it set up for a kind of regular size stick pack. However, when I first put this together, all I had was some shorties on me, so I used a 2S shorty, and it does allow mounting for a 2S shorty. So you don't really need a stick pack if you don't have one handy. However, if you're buying a kit like this, I would imagine you'd either have a few different types of batteries, or you'd be willing to get one. Towards the end of the manual, there is actually four or five different setup sheets that they provide um, based on, I'm assuming, their factory team drivers that they have. Um, one of them said basic carpet setup, track I go to, black carpet. So I flip to it and I go to try and figure out which pinion to get, 64 pitch. And the number there is really low. Um, one of the things that's also provided in the manual is a chart for gear ratio and a 30 tooth pinion with the spur that I have isn't even on, um, isn't even on that, that chart. So fortunately I was at the track, asked around and figured out what ratio I was shooting for. And when I went back and looked at the setup sheet, I realized that it's a European racing. Um, their spec racing is a little bit different than over here in the U S over here in the U.S., we generally have 17.5 or 21.5 turn motor spec racing. Over there, it's like 5.5. So that 30 tooth pinion 64 pitch that they had on the setup sheet was actually for a 5.5 turn motor, which is much different than what I was going to be using it for. So once I figured out the actual ratio that I was looking for, asking around some of the guys at the shop or at the track, then I was just able to go figure out which pinion I want based on the spur that I already had. So uh, I don't recall exactly what that was that I ended up getting because the number is written on the other side of the pinion and it's been a little while since I put it in and I don't have a setup sheet that I've actually recorded this, which you should do. Getting this and all this really beautiful carbon fiber and um, putting it all together was, was a lot of fun actually. As far as racing it's been, um, I haven't really raced it. I've taken it to the track. I've done some more like time, time trial type stuff or just, you know, for myself. Um, I'm pretty quick with it already. It'll be fun to put a little bit hotter motor in there, maybe playing around a little bit with the actual gear ratio that I'm going for, for whatever the track setup is for that day. Um, and then getting into maybe a little bit of dialing in the suspension and all of that. Um, if there's anything you think I should know for setting this up, go ahead and comment down below as far as what you think it should be set up for. Um, again, the track I'm at is black carpet. Uh, and also, because I'm really just kind of a lover, not an expert, let me know if I've made any mistakes, if there's anything you think I should have done when I set it up or just set it incorrectly here. All right, I'm here at Indy RC Raceway, um, the south side of Indianapolis. I just upgraded it with a 21.5 motor, uh, Hobby Wing XE run, um, so fast, really hooked up well, just need a little bit of a better driver. Uh, other than that, I think this thing's ready to go. Last time I was here, I actually uh, stopped uh, racing, tried out my 12 scale a little bit, wanted to go back and use the uh, MI8 again, and I took a look at it and the wishbone was broken. 
no idea what happened. I continued racing it, uh, you know, didn't have any spectacular crashes or anything like that. And then when I went to go pick it up again, a little wishbone was broken. So that's a little bit of a disappointment. Doesn't seem like it was too, too harshly raced and it still broke. So we'll see if they hold up. Unfortunately, they sell them in a pair and they're just different enough that you can't uh, use the same one. So hopefully if I break it, I break another one. We'll see you again. People have to say this, like, comment, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Thanks for watching, uh, and we'll be talking about some more RC cars in the future. Thank you.